So the Bears have not lost five straight games against the Packers. It's also the five, fifth straight loss to Green Bay in the Matt Nagy era. Matt Nagy has only beaten the Packers once. So you can imagine right now, yeah, everyone yesterday was seemingly talking about, okay, it was a game that the Bears should have won. It was a game that the Bears were in for the most part. And yeah, they were in it for the most part, but you couldn't close it out and you couldn't execute situationally. We're going to get to all that in just a moment here. But what's up, guys? Welcome into the Fireside Bears YouTube channel. Max Smith alongside of Sade Koshal, who you can follow us on Twitter. Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram at Fireside Bears. Follow myself and Max on Twitter at Usaid Kulshaw and at Max Smith ESM. But Max, what's going on, man? I mean, how you doing? Yeah, it was tough watching that game yesterday. I actually took a little walk in the third quarter. I just couldn't couldn't watch it anymore. So I went. It was a beautiful day out here in Florida for the first time in a while. So I took a walk, kind of breathe, allow myself to kind of calm down. I uh, went back into the house, turned the game back on, hopped on Twitter, and saw that uh, a majority of fans needed to take a walk and just breathe uh, and try to assess what was going on. So there is a lot to talk about uh, from this game, from a game mechanic standpoint to a game plan standpoint, down to individual performances. Uh, there's just an absolute ton to break down today. But I think most importantly what we need to do is talk about Justin Fields' progression, uh, things that we've been talking about literally for weeks, the same thing over and over again continues to be issues, and it seems like nothing is getting fixed. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, what what do you think coming off? Because there's so many different takes going around this game. But, I mean, like, what's your main takeaway from this game? Look, the Aaron Rodgers effect showed up yesterday. And when I say the Aaron Rodgers effect, I don't mean him completely taking over the game and winning. Because if you look at the Bears game plan yesterday, the Bears knew that they couldn't slow down Aaron Rodgers or Devontae Adams for that matter. They knew that that just was something that wasn't possible. What they did know, though, is that, hey, we can effectively neutralize both of these guys and at least make life harder for them. And so ultimately, when I look at that, you realize that that was one takeaway I had. But then the second takeaway I had was that the whole argument, and I think yesterday was the final straw, because the whole argument of Matt Nagy giving up play calling, but he can be a good head coach. I think that argument went completely out the window yesterday. And yesterday was the final straw simply because everyone was just like, okay, you know what? Matt Nagy's going to, if Matt Nagy gives up play calling, then everything's going to be fine. Yesterday didn't show that. Yesterday showed that the Bears are behind the Packers as a team that not only lacks talent at the quarterback position, and that's no jab at Justin Fields, by the way, because Aaron Rodgers is a hell of a lot better than Justin Fields. Aaron Rodgers for all. 30, for 31 other teams right now, Aaron Rodgers would make that team a Super Bowl contender, okay? But what it showed yesterday was that the Bears are poor when it comes to game planning. The Bears are absolutely terrible when it comes to execution. And number three, there's just an overall lack of focus to detail, which, by the way, the lack of focus to detail is such a big issue because Matt Nagy has repeatedly mentioned every offseason, hey, there's going to be an attention to detail. We're going to execute. This is what we have to do. We need to figure out the whys. Well, why don't you figure out why your game plan stink, man? Why don't you figure out what's really going wrong? Why don't you figure out why you've lost five straight to the Packers? And so ultimately, when we look at this loss, it's just like you look at the Bears right now, they are still light year behind the Packers. I know everyone, most Bears fans, it's a running joke that Matt LaFleur is only a good head coach because he's got Aaron Rodgers. And guess what? You know what? Any young offensive-minded head coach would look good with a future Hall of Fame quarterback under center. But you also have to keep something in mind is that the Packers do do a lot of things outside of Aaron Rodgers really well. And that's why they do have a high-flying offense every single year, okay? So on paper, is that offense only three or four people in – Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, Aaron Jones, possibly Robert Tunyon. Yeah. But hey, they make up for it because their offensive line's able to execute. And so ultimately, this loss just showed me the Bears are light years behind the Packers. And just because Matt Nagy's given a play calling and Justin Fields is the new kid in town now, it doesn't mean things are going to change because the Bears' entire approach needs to change. Yeah, incredibly well said. Um, it seems like there's this kind of general belief among the fan base that the second the season started, things were magically going to be better. 
we on this show have been saying for weeks that it wasn't and that it's going to take time that Justin himself wasn't going to come out and immediately become Patrick Mahomes. Like a bunch of people and the fan side of things expected that to happen for some strange reason. Like we're totally justified in hyping this kid up. We're totally justified in being incredibly excited to have a potential franchise quarterback that has shown signs of living up to that potential. But don't automatically throw him to the bin because he got beat by Aaron Rodgers and the Packers, uh, by by the way, at a time where it was only a three-point game. So by zero means should we be automatically throwing Justin under the bus. And it actually infuriates me that people are already doing that because it's clear that they weren't watching the game. Or if they were, they didn't know what they were watching. So there's a lot that needs to be said towards that. But on your point about Matt Nagy, on your point about – uh, understanding game scheme, understanding game plan, executing the details. It's clear that the Packers are just a better coach team. That's been the case for five plus, 10 plus years. I, you can't make an argument against that. Because, I mean, well, the Packers are the least penalized team in the NFL. That's not because they pay off the refs. That's because they're a genuinely good coach team. They have the details down to a T. That's why they win. There's a difference between teams that win and teams that lose. And it's not always just a balance of talent. It's how the coaches use that talent. We've been saying that for weeks. Matt LaFleur is smart. The Packers offensive coaching staff is smart. You think A.J. Dillon is the most talented running back in the league? Absolutely not. But is he going to succeed when Aaron Jones retires? Aaron Jones is getting older. He's slowing down. A.J. Dillon's the next man up. Yes, he's going to find success. Because he's in a scheme, he's in a team that is going to allow him to play well because they believe in the fundamentals. They execute, they hit hard, they like hitting. That's exactly what the Packers are. That's who they've been, and that's who they continue to be. And there's nothing we can do about it except for try our best to emulate that, do the same exact thing, do what we're supposed to be good at, which is hit even harder than them. This team doesn't have an identity yet. And we thought that it had one after the Raiders, which was run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball pass the ball every once in a while. That didn't happen. Khalil Herbert was having a fantastic game. And yes, he had his fair share of touches. He almost eclipsed 100 yards. I think he had 97 or 92 at the end of the day. Absolutely zero reason why he didn't get more handoffs. Absolutely zero reason we didn't see Artevius Pierce hand the ball off more. It seemed like they wanted to let Justin cook, and he did that first drive. And then the rest of the play called me in absolutely no sense. And here's my biggest grab before I'll pass it over to you. Because I want to talk about Justin a lot here because this was the game that I think I've seen the most progression from him. I think this was his first step in like the right direction. Like he took incremental steps, but I think he took like two steps in this game. When you look at Matt Nagy's play design, not a single quarterback in the league would be able to succeed in these conditions. When you have your multi-read progression, and now it's finally starting to click, when everyone was like, well, Mitch is a one read guy and, and it, he can't find the one read or it's not open. It's, it's done. Look at the play design. There's not a one, a two and a three. All of the receivers are developing the routes at the same time. What are you supposed to do when your one is covered? Your two and three just developed at the same time. You're looking at your one. Now the play is basically dead at this point and you have to improvise. You're asking way too much out of your quarterback. That's exactly what happened with Mitch. Routes develop. Mitch is supposed to let the ball go. Guess what? He's covered because the routes suck to begin with. The concept sucked too. And you're usually running man beaters against zone coverage. So they weren't going to succeed in the first place. Now, this rant's gone on a little too long. I apologize. But what is Justin supposed to do in that scenario? I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and this just goes back to the fundamental philosophy that we've been hammering home is you need to fit your offense to the quarterback. Now, I think there's two things to keep in mind. Number one, Justin Fields is absolutely not Mitch Trubisky. I would take 2019, and this is going to be a blazing hot take, by the way, because people seemingly have issues with some of the takes that I have. But I would actually take 2019 Justin Fields at Ohio State over anything Mitch Trubisky did in the four years here in Chicago because. The upside of one is tremendous compared to the upside of another, especially in terms of football talent too. But number two, I think what this comes down to is this, is that like Matt needs to realize that one of the big issues with Justin Fields is he's not able to play fast enough. Has he gotten faster over the last couple of weeks? Yeah. 
are there instances where you're like, okay, Justin, you're holding on to the ball too long. You need to get rid of that. Just throw it away. Don't try to do too much. Don't take a sack. Yeah. There are cases that though sometimes an incomplete pass is just better than nothing at all. Okay. They, then doing something like throwing an interception or taking a sack. I mean, look at the best quarterback in the game right now, Patrick Mahomes. The issue with Patrick Mahomes is that he tries to do too much at times, even for a guy who's in his fifth season. He'll just chuck the ball up, and next thing you know, oh, it's an interception going the other way, and then his mom is tweeting, oh, those shouldn't be interceptions, blah, blah, blah. I Side note, Mahomes family, I hate all of you. Y'all are absolutely pathetic, especially Jackson. But the point is that I'm making is that you need to simplify the game for Justin, cut the field in half, cut it. And Dan Orlovsky on ESPN said this, and Dan and I have texted back and forth a couple times, by the way. The issue that people don't understand is that cutting the field in half doesn't mean a quarterback is dumb. Cutting the field in half simply says, hey, we're going to run, you know, whatever. A f four guys are going to be out there running routes. Well, guess what? Instead of, we'll show four guys running routes, but really we just want you to choose between the receivers on the right side of the formation and left side of the formation, go from a four to a two basically is what this is. And so people don't understand that, but I've also got Justin Fields cause you brought up his progressions, right? Let's talk about his development here. Cause enough of ranting about the Packers, but the thing is, is I think when you look at Justin's development yesterday, by far was the most balanced offensive game plan. The bears had run. And if you don't believe me, go look at the numbers because Khalil Herbert had whatever, nine, 16 or 19 carries for 97 yards, averaged just about 5, 5.1 yards per carry. So that's really solid right there. Now, the second thing is that when you look at the passing chart that's available on Next Gen Stats, and we'll actually link that in this video too, by the way. If you look at this passing chart, you're seeing that Justin was 16 for 27. All right. The interception quote-unquote is not shown on here there were a couple incompletions obviously but what really stuck out especially on that first drive were the completions to darnell mooney to Allen robinson you go to the fourth quarter and that second touchdown drive i mean justin had completions to Allen robinson cole Komet now in the scene which is another thing we mentioned and so really what this game showed was that the bears are slowly continuing to develop their identity shifting away from some of that run first offense to more of a balanced offense and essentially letting Justin Fields just do his own thing and ensuring that, Hey, Justin showed that he can be a player that you can run a pass first offense with. You look at some of those throws into some of those windows yesterday. You couldn't have placed those better. Number one, number two, there's very few quarterbacks in the NFL right now that are as accurate as Justin Fields is. And the ball placement is absolutely beautiful. So, Anyone saying yesterday Justin Fields didn't look good probably wasn't watching the game or doesn't know what goes into quarterback development. Hey, Justin actually did more than most, all right? More than most rookies. And I think we're, what, six weeks into the season now. If you go down the list of the five rookie starting quarterbacks right now, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, and Mac Jones, they're all picked in that order. It's fair to argue that no quarterback is doing more with less than Justin Fields is. Maybe, maybe, maybe Mac Jones. Maybe there's an argument there because he has Nelson Aguilar uh, on that just crushing defeat yesterday. Uh, and not to say that Mac is the best by far, but he's certainly in a one of the better systems because he's surrounded by good brain trust there. Uh, so you know. We'll, we'll, we'll continue to see that. But what I really, when I'm talking about progression with Justin Fields, when I'm to, when we look at a rookie quarterback and we say, how is he developing, right? We like to use a bunch of different buzzwords. When we say cut the field in half, that essentially just means make the game easier, make it faster, get him used to throwing the ball out more. One of the only gripes that I have with Justin thus far, and this is something that will take time 100%. This happened to like, Every dual threat potential quarterback that has the ability to move. Look at Josh Allen. Same thing happened to him. He needs to decide if he wants to run or he wants to throw quicker because he knows he can get the yards himself. But does he trust his receivers to catch that ball? Does he trust himself to put that ball out there? The things that we want to see out of a rookie quarterback that we've seen from Justin thus far is accuracy. Like you mentioned, these balls are put in the exact right places that they need to be. Sometimes they sail a little high. 
but you'd rather them go high than low and you'd rather them go out of the hands of the wide receiver than into the hands of the D-back. We were looking at, is he making smart decisions, right? Is he forcing plays? Justin thus far has rarely forced a play. That's something that we all need to look at and go, holy cow, this is a quarterback in Chicago for the first time in a long time that isn't forcing balls into double coverage in ridiculous decision-making. We drafted Justin knowing that that's not what he does, and thus far we haven't been lied to. This is what he's bringing to this offense, which is great, which is what you love to see because that's usually the number one rookie mistake is just forcing the ball into places the ball has no business being. So if the intangibles of accuracy, decision-making, the ability to read defenses and know exactly where guys are going to be open and when, if all of those are there, then this kid is already steps ahead of other rookies, 100%. This kid has already that foundational piece to build upon into greatness. And that's there. We're already looking at fine detail, fine tuning. There's zero reason that by the end of this season, he shouldn't already look like a, a two-year prospect. And then at the second season, we're looking at a Josh Allen-esque sophomore year where he just comes out and absolutely stuns everybody. He goes, oh, well, I thought he was bad. And he's putting up ridiculous numbers, right? He is going to turn this team into a pass first team. And it's great that we already have Khalil Herbert, six round pick, absolute stud. DMO is coming back. Tariq Cohen has the ability to come back. We have zero idea of what capacity he'll bring back. So we do have the run game as an opportunity to rely on, but we won't need to because Justin every week has looked better and better and better. The hesitancy is gone. That's what got him destroyed in Cleveland was the hesitancy. The game was a little too fast for him. He wasn't sure. He wasn't trusting. He's practicing with these guys more. He's playing with these guys more. He's trusting himself more. And as that continues to grow, that relationship, that trust, his numbers will continue to grow. And all of the doubters will actually inversely grow because they won't be able to deny just how good this kid has been playing. Yeah, those are some great points, and I think we have to understand is that developing and drafting and developing a rookie quarterback, and I said this when the Bears drafted Justin Fields and we started doing these YouTube shows because I've said this on multiple other podcasts too, even dating all the way back to last year around this time, when it became apparent that it was just time to look forward to a quarterback of the future, drafting and developing a rookie quarterback is not a one, two, three-year plan, right? It the development part tends to be a two, three, four year plan sometimes, but then also the drafting of that quarterback. Yeah. That first contract is five years and that's just your initial investment. But really when you're drafting that rookie, you hope that it is a 15 to 20 year investment that you're able to hit on. And so it's just like, it's like this, right? It's like buying a house. Okay. You're going to go, you're going to look at a couple different options and then you're going to decide and narrow down, Hey, this is the one we want. This is what we see. This is what we're going to go ahead and do. This is essentially our game plan. This is why we like this house, the neighborhood, all that stuff. It's the same thing with a quarterback. And so I'll drop this piece of information for you guys. If you look at the way that NFL teams scout currently, you realize that Teams are always going to have prospects on their boards that are just graded higher because those players and those prospects have a certain level of talent and they fit whatever the team is trying to do offensively as well as schematically and personnel wise into whatever vision the coaching staff wants. And so Justin, a player like him would be significantly higher graded as a player that is a dual threat quarterback, a guy that can hit the deep ball consistently, a guy that can burn you with both his arms and his legs compared to a guy like Mac Jones, who, yeah, he's a prototypical pocket passer. He could be Matt Ryan light in the NFL, but the reality of the situation comes down to Matt. Mac Jones is unfortunately not as mobile as a guy like Justin Fields. That's just how these teams work and how these teams think. And so when we look at Justin, right, we're seeing that the coaching staff is trusting him more and more and more, which is a really good thing moving forward because lots of, I think, rookie quarterbacks where they really struggle. There's two places they struggle with in the NFL. And this goes back to you talking about Justin not forcing throws. The first thing they struggle with is the speed of the game. And the second thing they struggle with is really good sound decision making. Now, it's unfair to go out and to expect every quarterback to make every single decision perfectly because even the best of the best will mess up at times. But I think when you look at yesterday, 
And this just speaks to Justin's instincts and decision making. The one penalty yesterday, or the one interception yesterday that was supposedly an interception. Let me say this for the record. I don't know why Allen Robinson stopped running. Twenty players that are worth twenty million dollars do not stop running. Why are the Packers so good? These guys like Alan Lazard, Devontae Adams, Equinemius St. Brown. I'll tell you why. Because even when the play breaks down, those guys are continuously running because you know what? Hey, creating plays off script is something that good quarterbacks can do. And Justin Fields can actually do that and create plays off script. But the point is, is that the one quote unquote interception yesterday, that was a really smart decision by Justin. Why? Because Aaron Rodgers has been doing that to the Bears since basically 2006 or 2007. So, Ultimately, when you look at all this, right, you realize that, hey, Justin's continuing to grow in more ways than people realize. And the whole concept of stats don't define everything. Okay, the whole notion of, oh, he was 16 for 27, 174 yards, one touchdown, one interception. Throw that out the window because sometimes your stats don't dictate your development. Yeah, I mean, the stats haven't been great right thus far. Uh, but I mean, look, look at like, I'm really looking at Josh Allen for some reason that's just sticking to my head because both have incredibly similar play sets. And I know that we're talking about Russell Wilson, maybe even go back to Russell Wilson's rookie career. None of these guys that are like big name superstars in the NFL right now have had like genuinely good rookie situations where they really didn't have much around them. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes consistency and it takes your organization to surround you with talent to do well. But I, I want to go back and I want to beat the dead horse on that free play because that's such a smart idea for a rookie quarterback to just automatically feel like this is something that I need to be doing. That tells you how just how smart he is, right? How many rookie quarterbacks would just assume that it's a free play, make make some moves, then just chuck it downfield? Well, by the way, like you're right, if A-Rob continued to streak down that field, it would have been 14-0. The Bears are on top. That was huge. That just tells you his commitment or to his knowledge of the game. His IQ is up there. He's smart. He knows what he's doing. Now, obviously, there wasn't a flag there. I really don't blame him. It might have cost the game. But what I'm trying to say is, and this is like a weird thing because I don't mind losing if I know that my team is getting better. I don't mind losing if I know that Justin is getting better. That's what I'm trying to say here. I never anticipated this team to be three and three at this point. I thought we would be like, you know, maybe one and five, honestly. Uh, but three and three is nice. And yeah, we may look like we could compete at some times, but we're legitimately here this season to see and assess this rookie talent and to build upon talent that has already been developing. And that's really the idea, I think, for the ownership and Ryan Pace this year is what talent is, is, is developing where do we need to fill in the holes? What holes will be created soon? What do we need to do to put this team in a winning position? And that's why I legitimately think Ryan Pace is safe. I do. This is a little off topic, but I'm going to bring it into this conversation. I think he's safe. I would be stunned if he isn't, uh, but I can understand how if Nagy leaves, Pace will leave. But I think Ryan Pace has done enough to put players, to put people in positions, to fill some of those holes correctly that he has built a roster that goes eight and eight, that's made the playoffs three out of the last two seasons. Yes, they're not super great, but they've been developing talent. And there is homegrown talent on this roster that can compete in the future if we continue to fill those holes. Yeah, I don't look the whole pace naggy conversation, it shouldn't be off the table right and i think it is really relevant to this because i got we are going to talk about or i should say something you know whenever the concept of justin fields and him being the future of the bears comes up which is seemingly every single day if you're a bears fan it's more than clear that the fan base is seriously divided over pace and naggy now 50 percent of people will say okay well pace should stay naggy should go the other 50 percent will be like oh yeah fire both and then there's say uh, well i should say this a third say pay should stay naggy should go a third say fire both a third say we'll keep one or the other now i'm going to say this i think that people have to understand something is that it's the general manager's job to go ahead and to find talent that the coaching staff needs then from there it's the coaching staff's job to go ahead and 
develop that talent that the scouting department, the personnel department, as well as the GM basically ended up giving. That's what this all comes down to, okay? And so, yeah, Nagy had a big say in the acquisition of Nick Foles, Andy Dalton, as well as Justin Fields, but also Ryan Pace is the one that signed off on those moves because he was confident that Matt Nagy would deliver. So when we move forward with this, we have to understand is that this dysfunction you're seeing on the field right now, very little of it falls on Ryan Pace. It's all on the coaching staff. That would be like you blame, or that would be like someone blaming their boss for something that they had complete control of, but just completely botched the situation on an individual level as a manager or a supervisor. That's all this really is. And so I think that we, after a fifth straight loss and just one win over the Packers in the last six or seven meetings and one win since 2018, I seriously think that we're trending more and more towards Matt Nagy getting fired than Ryan Pace being fired. And I'll also add this in. Um, when you look at the Bears, right? This sitting at three and three through the first six weeks of the season. Now, this is actually the third time in the last four seasons through the first six games of the season that the Bears have been 500. And so that really kind of does end up bringing the question of, hey, what's going on here with Matt Nagy? Now, can Nagy save a job? Certainly. I think that the pendulum on whether Nagy's safe or not could swing either way. No, I completely agree. I think that we'll really have an answer by the end of this next five game, maybe even just four game streak. Um, if the if the Bears go under five hundred this year, it's very clear that one of them or both of them will be gone. I think that's just a fair statement to say. Uh, if they stay at five hundred, we might see one go. If they somehow sneak into the playoffs, I don't think we see either leave. Unfortunately, uh, so if you're an anti Nagy fan or an anti Pace fan, uh, unfortunately, you, you're going to be a little bit, you know, bittersweetness with some of your with some of your losses. Um, and again, I'm not saying that we should be rooting for our team to lose, but I'm saying that there are things uh, that we learn from losing. And Matt Nagy is completely right. Some of the only smart things he ever says on his uh, press conferences is, is that you learn from losing. You really do. You don't learn from winning as much as you learn from losing. Uh, of course, you'd learn uh, enough from losing as to why you're losing after you lose enough. Uh, but obviously that part hasn't translated into his brain there yet. But outside of that, outside of Matt Nagy, outside of Justin Fields, uh, there are some key little position players, areas of concern that I think we should jump on before we head out today. Uh, my my areas of, of concern moving forward right now is clearly safety. Uh, Sean Gibson and Eddie Jackson just aren't fitting the bill. Uh, we've been saying this for, for a while. Eddie Jackson is stuck in a crazy contract. He might be a trade piece as the deadline comes up. Uh, he might be attractive to some buyers that are looking to bolster their secondary on the second half of the season. If they think that they're Super Bowl contenders or move him during the offseason, he might be able to recoup some good draft picks and get some capital. Um, it's very clear we need to draft the safety. It's very clear we need to draft uh, some slot cornerbacks as well. It's very clear we need to bring in some young talent on the interior line position. Uh, they, I still think they're serviceable. I think a bad game's a bad game, but they've shown out. You know, you don't put up 97 rushing yards uh, if your interior line's not good, but it's clear that the pass pro just isn't there, and that's not going to fit the bill for Justin Fields. Uh, we have Temin Jenkins and Larry Borum. They're still hurt. They're supposed to be the solution to the pass pro that uh, Brian Pace and scouts put together, but unfortunately, they're still injured. Uh, no update on when we'll see either of them thus far, but... It's, it's clear the, where the issues lie on this team arm, and it's good that we're week six and we already know where we need to get better because that means that you can spend more time scouting, preparing reports, and going, what guys do I want to target, and how do I get them? Yeah, and we'll certainly ramp up our draft coverage once the calendar does turn to January, even if the Bears are playing for a wild card spot. But 
I, I think another thing to understand is that that inside linebacker position in a 3-4 defense, you're going to need another good inside linebacker next to Roquan Smith because, hey, Alec Ogletree, Danny Trevathan are getting older. The Bears eventually need to find that replacement. And Ryan Pace has shown in the mid-rounds he can find a serviceable defensive starter or just a defensive player that develops into a pretty serviceable starter. I mean, Bilal Nichols and Nick Kwiatkowski right now, if you were to make a list of all the day three picks that Ryan Pace has, you know what? Nichols is probably the best one on that list. Kwiatkowski, who's no longer with the Bears, is probably a really close number two. And then some way, somehow, you know, Eddie Jackson had two really good years, well, three really good years from 2017 to 2019. You could throw him in there too. Quick side note about the Eddie Jackson contract. His cap hit this year is about $5 million. That's going to jump up to about $15 million in 2022. And then around $17 million in 2023 if you go check Eddie Jackson's contract out on over the cap. But the good news is the Bears can cut him in 2023, designate him as a post-June 1st cut, save about $13 and. $13 million in cap space. The dead cap charge on that cut, though, is going to be right around $4 million. So you'd be looking at about $9 million in cap space created. But, yeah, you know, this team is going to need a complete offensive o- offensive and defensive overhaul, more so defense than offense because the defense is continuing to get older. And that's not even counting extensions that are going to have to be signed because – Going into the year, there were four main extensions for the Bears. And when I say going into the year, I mean the very start of training camp. It was Anthony Miller, possibly extend him, Bilal Nichols, James Daniels, and then Roquan Smith. That list is now down to three. You have Roquan and Allen Robinson as the fifth guy. Now you have A-Rob possibly extending him and Roquan Smith, those two guys. James Daniels and then... um. Bilal Nichols is the fourth guy on that list. And so ultimately, those are going to be some extensions the Bears are just going to have to mess around with. So hopefully they have enough money with all this extra revenue coming in from the Justin Fields jersey sales. But it's going to be something to continue monitoring because, again, this team right now, this core, there's very few players that are legitimately the future. And I think this year and next year are all about seeing what the future is all about for the Bears, because the future is way beyond Justin Fields. Yeah, absolutely. If we don't surround him with talent at the wide receiver position, if we don't draft in the offensive line, uh, we're already stacked for the future in the running back position, which is fantastic to see. Uh, And specifically on the other side of the ball, you know, when we're talking about what parts of the defense need complete overhaul, we're talking about our edge rushers. Travis Gibson is there, which is fantastic, but he can't be a one-man show. Uh, We have some young interior line, which is great. But our cornerbacks are still a situation that just just needs to be addressed as well as um, we need another linebacker to pair with Roquan Smith. Um, I'd be very shocked if, if we don't put as much money on the table as possible to bring him back um, as the identity and the heart of this defense moving forward. And, of course, at the, at the, at the safety position. So there are many holes to lot watch. Uh, more than happy to produce some draft content. Uh, we're already enjoying this college football season. If you haven't, it's been crazy. Uh, But I don't know if there's anything else we can really say. Uh, We learned from this loss. The Bears still don't know what they're doing offensively. Identity still isn't there. Justin's progressing. Defense is maybe staying the same, degressing a little bit in certain aspects of the game. But it's Aaron Rodgers. You know, it's it's, it's still nearly impossible to defend against Aaron Rodgers. Uh, And we definitely learned that it uh, feels a little good knowing that that was Aaron Rodgers' last game soldier field as a green bay packer 100 percent. i don't care if i'm in shock or denial that was his last game and i i don't care it's it's confirmed in my mind yeah i don't look it's you know the future's future's hard to predict right and and so you never know you could look up and aaron Rodgers could be playing with the packers in 2022 but that's something that we're going to table for now but as i look and since you brought up as i look at the bears 2022 opponents before we get out of here it honestly would not shock me to see a team like the miami dolphins or even the new york giants or even the washington football team some way somehow pull off a trade for aaron Rodgers, and the next thing you know he's back at soldier field next season because the bears are going to be hosting the um washington football team next year but anyways guys that's gonna do it from us listen make sure you're following us on twitter youtube facebook tiktok and instagram at fireside bears follow myself and max on twitter at usaid culture and at max smith esm 
We'll be back on Thursday to go ahead and preview Bears Bucks because the Bears are still, according to who you talk to on Twitter and your mindset and thinking, the Bears beat the Bucks last year, but then the Bucks won the Super Bowl, which makes the Bears the default Super Bowl champions. I don't know. Okay, the we Bears didn't make have the not... rules, folks. We didn't make them. It's just yeah. There. This is this is just people tweeting out random stuff on Twitter. But we're gonna get out of this thing, guys. Peace out. We'll catch you guys in a couple of days here and bear down.